It's wonderful to be back in this lovely room again, face to face. I'm very grateful to the society for this opportunity and to Colleen and Rita for their generous help with my presentation. Thank you both. And I also want to thank Jan for her moving Women's Inc. tribute to Hilary Lindsay, who died this year. Hilary was an inspiring role model, as well as you will know, a legend in this society and a mentor and a convener of my fellowship of Australian Writers Group. My great aunt, Margaret Caro, you can see it on the screen, adventurer and dentist extraordinaire, is also an inspiring role model. This book, with its evocative cover designed by my son, John, some of you may remember was highly commended, commended for the Society's 2020 Poetry Awards. At 16, Margaret married Jacob, a Polish Jewish physician, at least 10 years older, and immediately went with him to work on the South Island goldfields. What a way to start married life. Not only did she become a feminist and a social reformer, but she worked very successfully in the male dominated profession from 1880 to 1921. She was 73 when she retired. I found Margaret while researching my mother's family tree. She died the year before I was born, but I knew nothing about her, even though she lived and worked in Napier, a three hour drive from my hometown, which she visited regularly to see patients. I now know her intimately because Ted, my late partner, and I traveled in her footsteps around New Zealand. Margaret, a Presbyterian, became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1888. I think she was particularly attracted by their strict diet and focus on good health. She is legendary for extracting eight teeth from Ellen White, the charismatic American leader of the Seventh-day Adventist, was out anaesthetic, would you believe? She worked tirelessly for her church, teaching Bible studies, established a rescue home for young women, was instrumental in founding the New Zealand Dentist Association, and as well as that, she was a skillful horsewoman who rode long distances to treat patients. Her husband, Jacob, became a very respected doctor and public figure in Napier. They had three sons whose lives were equally intriguing. In fact, some of them shocking. Edgar was a very controversial doctor. He was an abortionist who worked to set up the Sand Hospital in Wollonga, which you probably all know about. I used my imagination to flesh out her extraordinary life. She and Jacob traveled from her hometown of Nelson to Christchurch, right across the South Island on foot to the West Coast goldfields, work in logging camps, return to Nelson and finally settle in Napier, where she sets up her very successful practice and experiences a destructive 1931 earthquake. I'll read a short excerpt for you. It's from the goldfield section, which most people seem to like the best section. The gold fields of Canieri. At last, we're going to the gold fields. The superintendent directs us to work at Canieri a few days a week. We harness jip to our new dray loaded with equipment to take where miners and multitudes have pegged claims beside the Hokitika River. As we round the last bend of the bone shattering road, we hear a cacophony, clatter of cradles, pings as picks strike flint, whining of a hundred windlass wheels, barks of diggers' dogs, thud of axes splitting logs, grunts, curses of exhausted men. Ah, Jacob declares, the Goldfield Symphony plays for us. The next one is Secret Diaries, which Maria mentioned. Press that. 
another creative cover by my son. He's very, very talented, I must admit. Although well, I finished this book in 2011, it took another 10 years to be published. And that saga is another talk in itself. We'll continue. Mansfield and her peers, including the Bloomsbury Group, lifted the veil of Victorianism and created a new way of living, seeing and writing that continues to resonate in our 21st century lives. Virginia Woolf is the most well-known of Catherine Mansfield's female peers. I read Woolf when I was young and was inspired by a rumoured one's own, as we all were, I'm sure. And reading about the bohemian lifestyles of the Bloomsbury group was both enthralling and titillating. Being a New Zealander, I've always been proud of the short story writer Catherine Mansfield, and especially proud that the house she was born in was saved, restored, and is now a museum. Do you visit it when you're in Wellington? After visiting it twice with my partner, Ted, I found C.K. Stead's book, the Letters and Journals of Catherine Mansfield, a selection, in a second-hand Wellington bookshop, and I was off on another exciting research journey. The two women had so much in common, I discovered. Catherine wrote in a letter to Virginia in June 1917, Ever since I read your letter, I've been a bit haunted by you. I long to see you again. In Virginia, in her diary, October 1924, Kay and I had our relationship, and never again shall I have one like it. They called each other Kay and V. Both flouted convention, Catherine more than Virginia. They were both members of the famous Bloomsbury Group, <coughs> which Virginia and her siblings formed in London in 1907. At their first afternoon tea together, they discovered they were both after the same thing. They were writing their lives. They influenced each other's writing and reviewed each other's books. Leonard and Virginia published Catherine's first book, Prelude. They were prolific, driven writers in spite of severe illness. Virginia, as you know, suffered with mental health and Catherine had TB. My book imagines they had a very intimate relationship, keeping secret diaries. Virginia is discovered by Leonard sometime after she drowned herself in the River Ouse in 1941, and Catherine's discovered by her lifelong friend and often badly treated companion, Ida Baker, at Gurdjieff's Institute in France after her death in 1923. Each poem is prefaced by a quote. The appropriate woman. I just read two of them. This is Virginia's Your Mind. Alone, I often fall down into nothingness. Dear Kay, in several months since your so thoughtless demise, I've written naught but dismal drivel. My new book, Sulking. Thumb stuck firmly in stubborn mouth, knowing you'll never read it. No day passes, but there's something I must tell you, ask you. Patient, long-suffering Leonard, you'll just not do. I need your mind. Damn, Catherine, I miss you. And then Catherine, this one's called Bliss which is also the name of a short story she wrote. Do you know the smell of wet sand? I still feel blissful. The beach at Island Bay, wind on my face, legs stung by spray, running with the orchestra of sea, freedom in pursuit of me. On bright, hot days, sisters and brother follow through paddock, sand hills, tussock, where convolvulus lies waiting to rope our ankles. 
hip loose sand, bruises our feet. We breathe acrid seaweed, seaweed smell, thrust faces into rock pools, forest wonderlands. Freedom tugs our wild hair and sets us singing. And last thing. The Climb Back Poems for Ted, published by Jin and Dara Press, and it's again a cover by my son. This book is a memorial to my late partner, Ted, poet and philosopher, who loved tramping in wild places. I met him in 2005 in Coromandel, New Zealand, and he shared my life for 12 years. It's a story of togetherness and separation. It's arranged in five sections. There are early poems about our meeting and our relationship, and later poems of grief, remembrance, and hope. I'll just read a few, they're very short. Life drawing. Draw her, draw him. Use soft willow. Tilt forms each to other. Have them touch. Dance them in negative space. Edge them with light. Give them murmured shadows. A notion of perfection. The possibility of happiness. Water music. You once told me that when a boy, your first paid job was tending rowing boats on the River Ouse. I see you, eager, nervous, meticulous in carrying out your tasks, cleaning, rowing, mooring. You rowed us on the lake in Pukekura Park, and again in ancient Knaresborough, where a viaduct bestrides the river Nid. The to and fro of your arms made water music. I was mesmerized, sorry, I was mesmerized by the rhythm your faraway gaze, the shape of your mouth. Afterwards, we drank coffee at the Riverside Tea Room as the warmth of the day haloed us with love and the river mirrored our happiness. Lura Gardens. While traveling by train to this place we visited so often, a reservoir of tears presses against my ribs. I do not want this pain to fill the hollow of your absence. Images of our time together explode behind my eyes. The lark ascending plays to my inner ear. Cherry trees in blossom line the streets like flower girls at a wedding. The gardens flaunt their colors. I wear the striped jumper we bought here. At the Waldorf Gardens Resort, the jazz group plays mood indigo under the spent posterior. Finally, outside my bedroom window. Outside my bedroom window, the sleek red wattle bird coughs from grevillea flowers. Would it be the very one that sang for joy those spring mornings when you were here? Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, there are flyers on your chairs that give details about the books. And they're for sale up the back, plus a few old ones. And one I did with Colleen too, called Mood Indigo, it's a chapel. Yeah.